Okay. Uh, the title of my presentation today is called uh, Planning for Climate Resilience, Learning from the Grassroots. Uh, funding for this research was provided by the Rockefeller Foundation through the Asian Cities Climate Resilience Network and through, uh, in cooperation with the Climate Change Coordination Office in Bingding Province and the Institute for Social and Environmental Transition. Between 2 and 3 November 2009, um, why is it cut off the edge of the screen there? Can we move the thing a little bit? It seems like it's cut off the edge of the screen. Anyway, between 2 and 3 November uh, 2009, a severe flood caused by a powerful typhoon hit the city of Quy Nhơn in central Vietnam. Uh, the flash flood be uh, began in the mountains west of the city and spread out across the delta of the Ha Tang River at a depth of more than two meters, causing roughly $21 million in damage and costing the lives of seven people within the city alone. Given that the areas hardest hit uh, by the flood were in the city's agricultural suburbs and that these agricultural suburbs were scheduled to be urbanized, uh, we decided to examine whether and how the uh, recent landscape changes had contributed to the flood and to ask how build out of current um, urban plans would affect the flood's impact in uh, Con, uh, under the conditions of climate change. Let me see. For some reason, it's not. Mm, let me check this. I'm not going to change anything. Sorry. We'll just move on. Um, so this shows you where uh, Queen Yun City is. Uh, on the east of the Queen Yun City is the East Sea, also known as the South China Sea. Uh, and these are the areas where we did the research. Uh, that's uh, Nhân Phu, Nhân Bình, Đông Đa wards, uh, Thuy Phuc, and Ziu Chi town. And the flood map you see is from Relief Web, and that's two days after the flood. Methods and rationale. Uh, we proposed a people-first grassroots approach beginning with open discussions with residents in 21 sites in the Ha Tang River Delta. Our discussions focused on flood cycles, agriculture adaptation, the chronology of the 2009 flood, personal losses, and probable causes for the flood severity. In later stages of the research, we used satellite images, hydrologic modeling, flood damage data, and urban plans to confirm, dispel, and add details to key points from these discussions. What you're going to hear today is a very, very brief uh, summary of that research. So first of all, let's talk about the explanations for the severity of the flood. The first and most common explanation was that the residents of the Delta had no warning in the mass media. As I said before, the flood started in the afternoon around 4 or 5 p.m. in the mountains west of the city, and it didn't reach the coast of Tinai Lagoon until around 10 p.m. During that entire period, there were no official warnings in the mass media or any other way. So some people were warned by friends upstream who called them on, uh, called them on their cell phones or sent images on their cell phones. Uh, this really points to uh, the need for an early warning system and community level participation. Uh, and that was the first priority project that we developed and is now being funded and implemented under ASRM. And I'd like to show you a very, very brief clip from one of our interviews. No? I have no sound. This same story was repeated to us many, many, many times. Um, basically, people told us if they had at least two hours warning, uh, they would have been able to prepare. I mean, these are people who have lived uh, for many generations in this flood, uh, flood prone environment. Uh, the second explanation for the flood 
was infrastructure and infilling. Um, physical barriers created flood cells in the delta, and water backed up behind these flood cells, causing increased flooding. Uh, and this is a little bit longer clip, and it's uh, with an elderly man named Mr. Tin, uh, who explains this for us. He starts off a little quietly, but he gets very angry. A lot of our research um, after we did these interviews in 2011 was trying to understand uh, actually what people taught us out of their own experience. And now I want to uh, talk to you a little about what we did following this. Uh, so one of the first things that we did is we got information from the city on uh, damage assessment from the flood. And uh, I'm sorry, this, I don't know why the aspect ratio is like this. The whole thing seems to be moved over. Uh, but I'll go through this step by step anyway. Uh, the first one is the coastal fisheries, uh, boats, and tackle. It's roughly $375,000 in damage. And 88% of that damage was in physical damage to fish ponds. Um, fish and shrimp in this area are all harvested before the flood season. So that's one of the adaptation strategies. Uh, industrial zones. Uh, about $10 million in damage to industrial zones, and 95% of that was in one industrial zone in Nyunbing, which was uh, probably placed in the wrong spot. The IC is placed uh, in the floodplain and borders a river. Next, housing. About $1.3 million in damage, and 90% of that damage was in Nyunfu Ward, where the rivers uh, flow into the delta, so it's basically at the junction where the main river channel divides. Um, Dykes Roads, a similar situation, but now also inclu including another uh, ward, Fukmi, which is upstream and uh, in, a, in a highland area. In the same case, where the rivers uh, meet uh, is where the damage is uh, worse. Uh, agriculture and livestock. Uh, and this to me is the most interesting story and it confirms what we heard about lack of warning. About three million dollars in damage. And um, you know the damage was primarily to rice that was held in storage because the farmers all harvest their rice before the flood season begins. And uh, loss of livestock, so buffaloes, cows, uh, pigs, uh, chickens and ducks. And the farmers all told us if they had at least two hours warning, and as I said, the storm started in the highlands at around 4 or 5 p.m. and didn't reach the lowlands to 6 p.m., so they did have time. Um, if they had two hours warning, they would have been able to prepare. 
And finally, forestry. There's about $2.7 million in, da in damage to forestry. And this uh, was all in the Fukmi Ward, which is about, uh, consisted of about 19 square kilometers of loss in forests, uh, primarily through um, the uprooting of young trees that had been planted for reforestation projects. And this is kind of indicative of the whole upper watershed. Okay, so we took the information that we had and we began to ask the question, uh, could we use a hydrological model to see what the impacts of that infrastructure were? Uh, and what we heard from the community turned out to be correct, that anything that restricts the flow of water into Tenai Lagoon increases flooding. So what are those things? Well, there was a, a road system that was upgraded from roughly 40 to 60 centimeters to roughly two meters in height. Uh, a new dike system had been put in place since the previous heavy storm about 34 years earlier. Uh, new urban construction, including two universities, an industrial zone, and uh, three new urban residential areas, and a new bridge. And what was the impact of this infrastructure? It increased the floods uh, by 11 centimeters here, 3 centimeters here, 70 centimeters here, and seven centimeters here. So then uh, we asked ourselves, what would be the impact of uh, the carrying out of the implementation of a Nyunbing area plan? Um, so you can see the Nyunbing area plan here on the map. It takes up um, about one third of the ward's area and uh, reduces the floodway to this narrow channel here between a new highway and uh, one barrage, one of the remaining barrages. Uh, our hydrological model also predicted that uh, the area plan would increase flooding uh, by 33 centimeters, 50 centimeters, 70 centimeters, and 76 centimeters. Now remember that the flood in 2009 was roughly two meters deep, so uh, we're talking about 2.7 or 2.8 meter deep water. Then we asked, <coughs> what would happen if we took the same model and we used it to assess the B2 climate scenario and sea level rise to 2050. And we found, again, 41 centimeters deeper here, 77 centimeters deeper here, 90 centimeters deeper here, and 89 centimeters deeper here. So we're talking in some places roughly three uh, meters deep flood. Um, and many people in these areas uh, died in the attics of their houses where they had retreated um, because they couldn't crawl through the roof tiles or they were trapped up there in the tiny airspace. So these increases in floods are potentially deadly. So what did we learn from this project? Well, the first thing that we learned is that the observations of people who experience these extreme climate events is a means of understanding the causes of their severity. Uh, the second thing that we learned is that they can also add detail and explanation to other available data sets, like a set data set on damage. Third, uh, we learned that hydrological models can be used to confirm, dispel, and quantify common observations or community observations. And finally, we learned that video and motion graphics offer a means of persuasively integrating community observations and technical research. So thank you very much for your attention.